thanks very much, John. And I would like to uh, welcome everybody to the Zoom and particularly to welcome Ben uh, Walcott, who will be leading the session, uh, Growing um, Aussie Natives in Pots. So Ben is a, a co-leader of the ANSPA study group on containers. Uh, and prior to that, I believe you are the study leader for the Garden Design Group. Yes, yes. Ben? Yeah and also president of ANSPA for a period of time yes. and have a fantastic garden in Canberra, which I've uh, yet to have the chance to see. But um, I think with over a 1,000 native plants of various descriptions, it, it would be an absolute delight, notwithstanding the Aramophilus not liking the damp <laughs> weather at the moment. Well, thank you very much for giving us the opportunity um, unfortunately, Roz isn't feeling very well tonight, so it, you're going to have to suffer with me. Um, as we heard, um, we have been involved in the Garden Design Study Group and still are certainly participants having a large garden. But in addition, uh, we have lots of plants in pots. And you know, this is something that's both good for a small garden, and I'm delighted that you're taking that initiative because one of the things Diana Snape wanted to do was to write a book on how to garden for small gardens because it's in fact more difficult than when you have a large garden that you can do all sorts of things and make mistakes and they don't show up quite as disastrously as in a small garden. But getting to to pots. So even though we, we have um, lots of plants in the ground, we also, as I say, have, have lots of pots and a, and a variety of plants. And there are multiple reasons why we grow plants in pots. And so I'd like to just sort of go through some of those. So first of all, of course, there's beauty. They, they are very attractive. Eucalyptus, summer beauty. There are a number of these grafted small eucalypts that do extremely well in pots. And um, there are things like many of the baronias, baronia heterophylla, for example, uh, very attractive, blooms for a long time. Uh, and, and we have there the Fibelium whitei, again, a lovely bright yellow color. So it's really for, for beauty. And um, then, of course, you can grow things for food. And these are some, uh, some of the citrus that we have um, growing in our pots. Uh, some of them, like the one on the left, the Rainforest Pearl, makes an absolutely spectacular marmalade. Um, it really is, is very useful that way. And the one on the right, which is called Sunset Lime, for some weird reason, because it's bright yellow, um, you, eat, you can eat whole and it's quite, the rind is quite sweet and the, the fruit is quite a little tart. So it's, it's really very useful. And it's interesting because people don't realize Australia has more species of citrus naturally than anywhere else in the world. And we really haven't done that much to, in fact, uh, make them commercial. Uh, the, the long finger limes are, are starting to get commercial. But they're, anyway, it's, so it's good to have food. And of course, you can grow other edible things in pots. One of the main reasons we grow things in pots is because many of the plants that we like absolutely hate our climate or soil or both. So Canberra is blessed with, with clay predominantly where we are. Uh, other parts have, have much better drainage, but we have quite heavy clay. And so a lot of the stuff from Western Australia um, it turns up its toes and, and doesn't like it. And other th and things like the Banksia victoriae, which is in the middle here, um, that doesn't like frost. And so what we do is we move it out 
into the open in the summertime and then when late autumn, when things we move it under the eaves of the house where it gets protected. And things like the Baronia Keziae, which is an interesting plant, by the way, because it was really uh, recently rediscovered. And it is a fantastic Baronia. I really, it is one of my favorite plants, just masses of these pink flowers for hmm, three months. And um, on, on quite a, a neat sort of, not terribly compact, but quite a nice bush. So the Banksia menziesii, we've had in a pot for a long time, blooms every year. Same with the Banksia victoria. So they don't like our climate or soil. And obviously in a pot, as I say, you can move them into protected areas and you can also control the soil. Now, one of the things that you sort of, when I was growing up, as it were, you were told when you you potting something up, you go up pot sizes, all right? So you go from a small pot to a bigger pot and so on until you get to the full size. And that's, we have not been doing that. Our argument is that if you have a plant and like the Banksia victoriae, which you know is going to be big, you get a big pot and then you can adjust the soil, etc. And you put the small plant in the middle of the big pot and you let it grow. Because in fact, that's what you would do in the garden. And we found and had great success doing that rather than trying to keep potting things up into bigger and bigger pots. So that's just sort of an aside. Now, relevant to your idea of a small garden is what happens if you only have a balcony? This is friends of ours in Canberra who've just moved. They had a lovely native garden in their house, but they moved into an apartment and it has this large balcony and um, they're able to put uh, all these pots on it. Now, this is up on about the fourth floor, I would reckon. And it means, of course, they have to schlep all the plants, the pots, the potting mix, etc., up from uh, the basement or from the car park up to the, their apartment. But that's what elevators are for. And, uh, you know, a shopping cart, you put all the things in and you can just roll it along. And speaking of rolling, what they've done, which I think is a fantastic idea, is they put a lot of these plants on rolling uh, sort of casters, on stands. It does two things. One, it allows for good drainage. And the second thing is it allows easy movement of the pots around as plants change, grow, etc. And the owners, Andy is is has bad arthritis, so lifting and moving pots is is difficult for him. But here, it's easy to to move things around as you need to, um, and it shows that in fact, if you look up 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 in here, you have a flowering warata. You can have a whole variety of plants in a garden like this in a relatively modest space. And on the bottom left, you can see the view out over this garden to Parliament House on the left and the giant squirker, as we call it, the fountain cook jet uh, in the middle. So again, I think for small gardens and for balconies and a lot of people now, and particularly in Canberra and other places are moving into apartments and yet they want to have some connection to the plants, and this is a jolly good way of doing it. And of course, for indoors, it's, it's again, you, you tend not to necessarily think about it, <clears throat> but maidenhair fern, for example, will grow up very well in a pot in your house. Uh, on the right is, is a uh, Howea frustriana, Kentia palm, from Norfolk Island, and which is which has now gotten rather too large, I'm afraid, 
um, and is because it's been too well looked after by Roz, and we've had to move it to another place so it has a bit of room to grow. Um, I've grown orchids for a number of years, and a lot of the native orchids grow very well in pots. And the beauty of them is that you can grow them outside, and when they start to bloom, you bring them in, and they provide indoor color. Um, and on the right, bottom right, you'll see there's a whole mass of these things uh, that are happen to be at one of our Orchid Society, Canberra Orchid Society shows. So there's great variety of color and shape. And as I say, this middle one, this Phaeus, is, is one of Laurie Smith's that he brings into his house. So think about for indoors. And as we found, some plants just, they, they in theory will grow in the ground, but they just seem to do better in pots. So on the left is Cambra, is Caria Cambra bells. Now the story of that plant is that when Cambra turned 100 years old, the chief minister decided that there had to be a yellow rose named in honor of Canberra's birthday. And that upset one of our local newspaper writers, columnist, who was very interested in native plants, who said, yeah, you can have a rose, but why don't you have a native plant? And so Roz and I made an appointment, went over to the chief minister's office and talked about it. And they said, well, how would we go about getting a plant that would be named for Canberra's anniversary. It's an easy. Peter Alderman Shaw at Bai Wong Nursery is producing plants all the time. Being a long story short, we went out there and a whole group of us and voted and picked Coria, what's now called Canberra Bells. At that time it was Coria number A463 something two. And um, it's a lovely plant, grows very well in a pot. Um, and it turns out it grows much better in a pot than it does in the ground, unfortunately. It's not a very robust plant in the ground, but in a pot, it's spectacular. And we found similar things with some of the rupaws, things like some of the bush dance, bush pearl, etc., do much better in pots uh, than they do in the ground. And uh, why that quite is, I'm not so sure, except I guess one can control the, the media uh, that they're growing in. And one of the things that um, RuPaul's like is a lot of fertilizer, and they even quite like high nitrogen fertilizers and high phosphorus. Um, and so uh, we, we can sort of deal with that without worrying about other adjacent plants. And of course, baronias, for at least 75% of us, have an absolutely wonderful smell. And so on the upper left, you see a, a sort of a patio area outside our kitchen. And <clears throat> those are mostly baronias. And um, the smell is absolutely spectacular. And it comes into the house when the doors and windows are open. And these, you, if you have enough baronias, you sort of have them in flower for at least a good two, three months. Uh, and and it's, it's, it's very refreshing, put it this way. If you're one of the 25% people who cannot smell baronias, uh, my condolences. Now, what sort of pots do we use? Well, Obviously, you know, you need a number of drainage holes. That's fairly obvious. I always try to find one that doesn't require a stand. That is, if you look at the bottom middle, there's this lovely ceramic pot, but it has to be on a stand because it, the bottom is flat and the drainage holes are in the bottom and therefore it won't drain. And that means it's a real pain when you have to move it, move it uh, because you have to move the base. Now, of course, this is taken at Cranbourne um, and um, the little banksias 
are growing happily in, in a large metal container. It's a similar to the ones I showed you at the Botanic Gardens in Canberra. Um, so again, that just has good drainage. Um, so we like these sort of commercial pots which have a raised lip around the edge and then sort of um, spaces for the water to go out. So they sit, can sit on a flat patio and still drain perfectly happily. And of course, the other solution is, is what you see here in the Botanic Gardens in Canberra, which as I said, where you have a pot that doesn't have a, doesn't have a, a bottom. And so it gets, perfect drainage down through into the soil. And of course, if you want to put it into a decorative pot, like a brass pot or whatever, you can just simply put a, a pot within a pot, uh, put one of these draining pots in. But of course, you have to be careful when you're watering that the water ultimately will, will move out of the, the pot with the plant in it. So we've not done that because it's just another, another bit of a nuisance. And um, so then what do we use for, for potting mix? Well, we saw a, a program on Gardening Australia where out at uh, Kings Park, they, they use perlite, which is quite common, but we don't like perlite for a number of reasons. Uh, so we use a mixture of roughly one course, uh, one part coarse washed river sand, and we have native potting mix we get from a local company here in Canberra called Martins, and we which has a bit of wetting agent in it, and it has some fertilizer. And so we just use a mixture. The mixture varies depending on the the particular plant, how how much of it, how much drainage it really needs. Um, but perlite is, is a bit of a nuisance because <clears throat> it's really nasty. You have to use it wet. And then what we do with the, when we've repotting or when we're, a plant has died uh, is we you re re reuse the soil by dumping it into a compost area. And if we had uh, perlite, it would sort of, get everywhere and be unsightly, whereas the sand, of course, um, basically disappears. So we use, as I say, quite a, and, and you know, in a big pot, you, you do the usual bit of putting a bit of broken pottery at the bottom. I know other people use styrofoam, you know, pieces of styrofoam, that way it gets good drainage. <coughs> the plant if it has particularly shallow roots, can be up the top, and it it means the pot isn't so heavy. So that it just depends. I tend to use old broken pot uh, to just to to make sure there's good drainage and the soil doesn't plug the drainage holes. And sort of last, um, Roz and I are now running the Australian Plants for Containers Study Group. Uh, this group was running for a number of years and then it, it stopped. And so uh, after we, we gave up and handed over the garden design study group to Laurie Smith, we thought, gee, you know, we've got a lot of plants and containers and we want to restart this study group. And, but we made a number of decisions and one is that There'll be no printed newsletters. You can print them if you want. And that means, of course, we don't have to charge dues, which means we don't have to have a bank account and have to do audits, da, 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 to make it simple. So everything is electronic. And um, any member of AMSA affiliated societies is more than welcome to become a member and to contribute to and receive these newsletters. And what we're hoping to do is to get people talking about what plants they have in pots, what their experiences are, um, how they look after them. So people often ask us, um, how do you 
do you fertilize? And the answer is yes. Uh, we fertilize all our garden with a slow release native fertilizer. We use, and we just do a very light scattering on the pots in twice a year, once in autumn and once in spring. And of course, the big thing about pots is, and their downside, is you do have to water them. And uh, in the height of summer last year, we were watering sort of every day, sometimes twice a day. Uh, in the winter time, you know, once a month, once every fortnight, depends on the plant, depends on the mix. Um, I know people have set up automatic watering systems for pots, um, sort of associated with a timer, and that works. Um, but it just is, is um, it's very satisfying growing these things in pots. <clears throat> and we would welcome new members. We have about 80 at the moment. Um, as usual, it's a matter of beating the whip to get people to contribute. Uh, just, you know, a picture or two and a few words of text uh, really, uh, you know, helps people get an idea of what you can grow in pots, how to grow them, and, um, and really enjoy having nature close to you, even if you're living in a very small apartment. So that's really all I, I think I wanted to, to say. That's fantastic, Ben. Thank you very much for that. All right, then. Well, I think we're going to say thank you very much again. That was a fantastic talk. Really enjoyed that. Well, thank and, you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us on our first, uh, first little virtual group uh, discussion. And we, I hope that you will both sign up to the um, study group, but also help us develop this whole idea of the, yep. the virtual groups and the interest groups. And, yes, thank you very much, Ben. I really appreciate it. And all our best to Roz as well. I will.